Hello, everybody. This is Noah and John, and we are from Urban Digs. And John, we're doing a little talking Manhattan today, and we got an old friend. We love him very much. The industry loves him. He's done so much for this industry for such a long time. We got Frederick Peters, the president of Warburg Realty. And now I believe you're at CB Warburg now, right? Now we are CB Warburg, Noah. Yeah. CB Warburg. And, you know, Fred, we go way back. We go way back and, you know, you've done a lot for us and we love having you on here and the audience, you got to listen to what this guy says because he, he sees a lot of data, but more importantly, he gets all of those anecdotes from all of those people that he keeps in touch with. So I want to get right to it, Fred, and I want to hear what's going on in today's market in your view. It has rarely been a more challenging question to answer because I feel that the submarkets are all behaving quite differently. And at the same time, buyer behavior is harder to quantify than at any time in the recent past. So let's start with the top of the market, which is what everybody loves to talk about, even though, as we all know, it makes up a minute percentage of the work all of us agents are actually doing at any one time. There is still some life in the very high-end condo market, especially if you're talking south of 23rd Street, uh, there is, you know, there are penthouse sales in Chelsea, in Soho, in Tribeca. Some of the big lofts are selling. But here's the main thing to emphasize about that is that it's almost all the condo market. The historically more active co-op market in which there are, I'm quite certain, still more, there are still more co-ops than condos, especially in Manhattan, though the percentages are leveling out as the years go by. The high-end co-op market has really been dead as a doornail. And in particular, I would say that's true of the high-end co-op that needs a renovation. You know, especially with the larger apartments, people have usually lived in them for a while. And between the supply chain issues, and the increasing cost of construction. You know, I remember, no, I remember a time when I used to tell people that you could do a decent renovation, not ultra high end, but a decent renovation for 250 bucks a foot. And that wasn't that long ago. And now doing a decent renovation costs more like 500 bucks a foot. And the fancy renovations with a uh, name architect, that's over a grand a foot. And if you're talking about a hundred square foot apartment and you're gonna do a fancy renovation, you're looking at adding three and a half million bucks and probably two years onto your process. And increasingly, honestly, people just don't want to go through that unless the price is really right. Um, and so yeah. I'll just say one more thing about that market and then I'll move on down the line, which is that this is a market in which it's enormously challenging to get seller and buyer expectations in line because these are fancy apartments in fancy buildings, and most sellers are anticipating fancy prices. And the buyers just aren't paying those prices when they need to renovate. And you know, Noah, increasingly, there are really only two kinds of apartment, which is mint and everything else. 
Yeah. And um, not even, not even like a renovation from like six, seven years ago. That still that's still no well. Mint. Right. That's what I'm talking about. There's a big penalty for those. It's like, there's a line. It's either you're on this side or you're on the other side. It's like, we can't touch it, but it's there. It's just yeah. the strangest and thing. And if you're on the other side, even if it still looks really nice, people are probably going to redo it. And yeah. they're going to be factoring that cost into yeah. what they pay. So Inflated as you move cost. on down the line, I would say that the market in which far and away the most deals are transacted is 2 million and below, probably even one and a half million and below. There's still some legs to that market. People are trading those properties, I personally believe that one of the reasons is, and we can talk about this later if we have time, that the rental market has just been at a level which none of us had ever seen before, both in terms of price and in terms of velocity. Mm -hmm. So I think there are people who end up buying because in the end, the after-tax cost is not significantly better if you're renting than if you're buying because the rents not only have gotten so crazy, but if you don't act on the rental you see within the first 45 minutes, somebody else has rented it. Right. Yeah. And that's, um, and that's one of the things that, sorry, Fred, I didn't mean, that's one know, of the things that we've, ahead, been, we, we've been looking at is that, you know, we, we were anticipating record rents hitting the summer. It looks like we're bumping right up against that level. So you're stuck between a rock, the rental market and a hard place in the sales market. And, you know, you mentioned a couple of the extreme challenges that are out there right now for sellers, right? It's, you get, you have renovated versus unrenovated. You've got price points that are, that are causing issues. As you said, some of the neighborhoods are not tra trading as well as some of the other neighborhoods. At the same time, buyers are facing issues, right? Because there's just not a lot of supply for them to choose. And the third issue that's kind of sort of overall for everybody is the summer. I mean, we're recording this right now. It's early August and August is typically the slowest month of the market. And I'm curious, Fred, I mean, you sit in a seat of high importance and you see below you, the mountains and the valleys of Manhattan real estate. And I'm wondering, how does this summer look like in terms with all of these challenges? What kind of things are you telling your agents to have conversations with on the buyer and seller side? You know, John, it's interesting because I think when you talk about the market, there are also a couple of other issues, especially when we're looking at that 2 million and below market. One of them is interest rates that even though they're increasingly baked in, what somebody like me who has been in this business, as I like to say, since dinosaurs roamed the earth, interest rates at six or 7% seems kind of normal. But we have an entire generation of younger people who grew up in a virtually free money environment. And so for all of those people, this is a big adjustment and it definitely has an impact on prices. And the other thing I would say is my experience increasingly is that while there is some seasonality to our market, in strong markets in 2021, we kept busting through it. I think the bigger issue is, and I think there are like any number of factors that go into this, but I think buyers are uneasy. And I wouldn't say that that uneasiness is specifically about interest rates. I think it is still a form of post-pandemic anxiety. Hmm. You know, what does the new normal look like? Are people actually all going back to those midtown office buildings? If not, what's going to happen to them? Why can't the mayor seem to get anything done? I think there is this just sense of 
I love New York. I'm committed, but at the same time, I'm wondering what's going to happen. Right. And I have a 24 hour news cycle in which I'm being bombed with hateful <laughs> messages about the president on the one hand, information about the multiple indictments against the former president. On the other hand, we live in a moment that's kind of uncharted in US history. And I think people are nervous. And one thing I've learned from my many years in the business is that it's a lot harder to get nervous people to transact. I think that's a fantastic point. And you know, every Monday on Urban Digs, we have Macro Monday, and Noah and I sort of talk about what's happening at a high level. And it's a very it's a communal thing. So a lot of people kind of chime in with, you know, what's what they think is happening. And, and that's a common sentiment is that there's a lot of this uncertainty. But I want to ask you, Fred, I kind of want to put you on the spot on this one. Do you think at all that that's sort of a contrarian indicator, right? You know, the, the old phrase, buy when there's blood on the streets. I mean, clearly we're not seeing that, but we're seeing massive amounts of uncertainty and we're seeing it in various pockets. Would that indicate to you that if you're a buyer, hey, this actually might be a good time to buy? Absolutely. Unequivocally, I would say the answer to that is yes. Look, you have to do your homework because we are not at one of those moments, John, which we are at every now and then, in which buyer perspective and seller perspective are on the same page. One thing I can tell you is, and my agents and I talk about this all the time, Every day, the largest number of emails we all get is price reductions. So there is still a sense that sellers aren't quite on board with the realities of the current marketplace. And then, John, we have this new challenge especially in the 5 million and under market, which is co-op boards turning people down because they're unhappy with the prices. <laughs> you know, you have this completely unrealistic perspective on the board and they want to game the system by telling the buyer and the seller to add a hundred grand to the contract price and then reimburse it at the closing as a credit. So we have that going on at the same time. So a lot of the time, I think the brokers are, you know, something brokers say to me all the time these days, which they never did before is, do you think the board is going to turn down this price? I mean, usually that only happens when the market has been declining. Yeah. When, when the market's been going, I think of the great financial crisis that happened a lot. Yeah. I think about the pandemic that happened yeah. a lot. But and I look at the market now, now. too, Noah, because <laughs> the market, the actual market at which transactions are being done a lot of those transactions are cheaper well well i'm hearing you know a, a couple of things that i'm hearing anecdotally before i go into yeah. my next question yeah. uh, echoes echoes what you're talking about today a few things are going to be it's a highly bifurcated market we've talked about yeah. this there is a steep penalty to pay for intervention on properties steep penalty to pay and I'm also hearing terms like it's a bloodbath in certain markets. And you don't, you look at the aggregate data, which is what John and I do. I don't see bloodbath in price blood action. Bath. No, I don't either. But, but there but, are but situations. No, let me make one point to yeah. you. People yeah. who bought, depending on when they bought in yeah. the last 10 or 12 years, yeah. they are not making money. Yeah, and, and I think there's some sectors of the market, some products, some price points that people overpaid as well, and now they're getting penalized for things they overpaid for in today's market, and they might be getting hit a little harder than a lot of others 
And I think I, I think that this is adding to the mystery and the challenge of this market. John, you got something? Well, I was going to say, say that's one of the challenges that I think Fred was elucidating, right? You have you have people who bought in 19, even 2021, and it may have sunk, as Fred said, $1,000 a square foot into a high-end unit. And now they're sitting at a price point at which it is certainly not going to transact for a price that makes them whole. So, you know, you think about part of the issue with the market is a lack of supply, especially in Brooklyn. And, you know, you think about all the marginal sellers, not maybe not necessarily interest rate driven, but sort of, you know, bottom line driven. Like, I'm not putting this thing on the market unless I can actually, you know, make back what I've put in. And we're yeah. a ways away from that point for a lot of folks. And we are a ways away. And you know what? Yeah. We're yeah. even <laughs> yeah. a ways. We're, what we're seeing is we experienced the peak of the market as being like 2016. The people who bought in 2015, 2016, even if they didn't put a lot of money in, they're still trading at 10% lower. Yeah. I I, I mean, I, I think you guys are making a lot of sense. And you know, with this interest rate, it's very expensive to move today. It's very expensive to move. You got to think about that. It's this interest rate environment, you know, we're, we're, it seems like we're handling it. Oh, it's probably, it's an uneasiness. We're handling it. Okay. But you know, we haven't been here. We haven't been here too long. You know, John made a really good point on macro Monday that, you know, it takes six to 10 months or so for these rates to really. So uh, the last six months of, we haven't really seen the full effect of this level just yet. And the fact that we might stay here for a while longer is we got to keep an open mind to that. I want to move on with the questions because I want to ask this question. We've been talking about the challenges so much. I want to talk about success, maybe. Success, Fred. Is there anything that you're noticing that is working in today's market, either for sellers or for agents? Is there any strategies or anything? Get a listing in Brooklyn. <laughs> no inventory in Brooklyn. You can sell anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, let's say let's say you're in Manhattan. Sure, Sweet. <laughs> All right, we got Brooklyn covered. Brooklyn. What um, about Manhattan? Um, it has to be something. Be very price conscious. Be very, very careful there. Not to miss what that. I would say. Okay, so let me ask you a question, Noah. Are we talking for buyers or sellers? All right, let's or are talk we for talking for agents. Let's do both. Let's do all three. Let's start with sellers. Okay, sellers first. If you're a seller, this is as price sensitive a market as you've ever been in. And it's also a market in which visuals really count. You cannot leave your property looking crummy and expect somebody to buy it. Even if they're going to walk in and know that they have to redo it, you still have to make it look clean and fresh in order to get buyers interested. I think the number of sellers who push back on staging or cleanup is remarkable considering how profoundly impactful it is. You know what, guys? Maybe not even as much on price as as time on the market. Mm -hmm. um, totally, but yeah. totally connected so to. I would say that's one thing as a seller you need to do. The other thing you just can't be is aspirational. Yeah, big penalty there. What about buyers? If you're a buyer, you you got to you and your agent have to do your research, you know? You find the stuff that's been on the market a little while. You find the stuff maybe that does need to be freshened up, but doesn't need a gut. And there are gonna be some opportunities there because, you know, there are always discretionary sellers and non-discretionary sellers. And the non-discretionary sellers, they got to get out. Yeah. And so at a certain point, you're going to have a real opportunity with some of those properties that have been hanging around. I absolutely love this. And I want to repeat it for anyone that's listening, especially if you have buyers, clients, if you're an agent and you have buyers, clients. Listen, we discussed 
how this market is bifurcated and you got the, the there are buyers that are rewarding this side and penalizing this side and it's it's like black or white there's no gray zone and what he's what fred is telling you is focus on that 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 penalized bucket there's a bunch of cream that's rising to the top there that's not doesn't deserve to get penalized as much in today's market doesn't deserve it but it is that's i love that i love that and Agents. I think you summarized that perfectly. That's exactly right. Thank you. Final thing, agents, and then I'm going to let John ask his last question here. What, what, what could agents potentially do to help with success? Well, I think, you know, one of the challenges with being an agent is that you're often, unless you really have a lot of experience, you're often afraid to tell the client what you think they don't want to hear. And this is a marketplace in which people have to hear things that they don't want to hear. And so I would say if I had one overall piece of advice for agents is it would be try to develop a strategy for having the difficult conversations. And I would say there are a few things that I can suggest. You know, in a way, Noah, it, it begins and ends with you guys. Uh, data is just more convincing than anything else. Most buyers and sellers these days don't want to hear anecdotes. They want to see data. And if the data demonstrates the different price ranges, you know, you guys do that great chart about how long things stay on the market. Yeah. Um, that is a great chart to bring with you to an exclusive pitch because there it is the way you shoot yourself in the foot if you price wrong yeah um, price price right we get rewarded um and price it wrong and you're getting penalized over 10 you get penalized and yeah. i would go on to say along with that there is a piece of anecdotal evidence that you use along with that which is I've always said, and I don't draw it on paper, I draw it with my hand. Every listing with very few exceptions has an arc in terms of buyer attention. And the arc goes like this. You start here and you get a couple of weeks and then you go like that. Right and now. then often you're there for a while and then you have a blip. But that blip could be six months down the road. And it could be inspired by a price reduction. And the other thing I can tell uh, agents to tell their sellers is, and I can't explain this, once buyers have walked away from a property because they feel the price is wrong, nine times out of 10, they don't come back when you reduce it you've lost them because emotionally they put it out of their minds and moved on. So you, it's kind of, you know, you're guaranteeing yourself a long stretch on the market if you lose those first weeks yeah, when right. it's like that. And then of course, now where you have the other problem, which is they listen to you, they price it where you suggest you get a great offer up front and then they're sure you've underpriced it and they don't want to take that offer because they think this is an indication that something better is coming down the line. You know, I always used to joke that with developers and it's become true of all sellers at this point, there are only two conversations you ever have with them. One is the property sold fast, which means you underpriced it. 
The other is the property sold slowly, which means your marketing's no good. Those are the only two conversations. Very convenient. Well, I, you know, I think Fred, you 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 absolutely nailed it, and I think you know part of it is the data, and the other side is exactly what you're talking about, which is consumers don't want to hear the anecdotes, but honestly, there is a ton of wisdom in anecdotes, and if you can combine those, you get that context right. That's magical. And I think, you know, Noah and I are always happy to be the lightning rod for those bad conversations in which, hey, you're you're overpriced or you're actually not going to get what you think. Like this is this is kind of what we're good at. But there's an emerging field out there, and that's AI. And that's kind of tries to take a lot of that mysterious data that you're talking about. You're going to have to draw by hand, and it tries to put a bit of a spin on it and make it worthwhile. And I'm curious, any thoughts on the AI revolution as it approaches real estate? So, John, I'm going to urge you to read my latest Forbes piece, which is on precisely this topic. And yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about it. You know, I think AI is fascinating and amazing and terrifying all at the same time. And I definitely have agents who are using ChatGBT to write property descriptions. I definitely have agents who are starting to use ChatGBT to do research. And I think that it is going to play a bigger and bigger role in agent and buyer and seller support as time goes on. That being said, I also believe that it's going to be like the internet was. You know, we as agents, if there's one thing we really need to be, it's adaptable. The world changes and we have to adapt. And as a corollary of that, we are always updating our value proposition. We're in a situation now in which we still need to be focused on a couple of things, primarily what AI can't do. In the end, it's a data aggregator. And data is critically important, but the home buying decision is also very much an emotional decision. And at least for now, AI is not able to provide that in spite of that story we've all heard about the bot that told the reporter to leave his life. Well, you know, I, in your, in your, in your Forbes piece, you mentioned that one of the things that the bots can't do is I, I, it, it, why humans are still needed, right? They can't judge that tone of voice. They don't make the eye contact. They can't catch yeah. those nonverbal clues. You and I think that's a great between point. Between the lines, that's what we do. You know, so many of the deals I made in my career were because I heard the unspoken desire. You know, you create a priority of needs. I, I've written a lot about the fact that a phrase that real estate brokers have historically liked to use is buyers are liars. And I've written a lot about the fact that that's not the case. The truth of the matter is buyers are developing an understanding of what their priorities are as they go through the process. And mm -hmm. so where they end up is very often quite different from where they started because they're becoming educated too. And while data is a very helpful tool in, in leading them to those conclusions, at the same time, you need to be intuitive about what people really want. Is size more important to them? 
does it turn out that location really is more important to them? Yeah. Do, where do they, you know, and they often don't know themselves. Yeah. Um, the, 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 there's so many nuances to the different personalities, psychological makeup, the needs of all the clients that you're going to encounter over the course of your aging career. And every buyer is going to have their own different needs and different concerns and different stresses. And each one's going to have to be handled in a unique manner. And the best brokers learn this they over time. Right. And they and they see And they it. also know that even the buyers sometimes don't even know what those things are. Yes. And, and and sometimes their job is to educate them and to say, listen, you know, you may think you want this, but you know, I'm not pushing or steering you, but I want to make you aware of some other options over here. And they end up happier than ever that they made yeah. that uh, that awareness, that awakening to that with more information. I you look know, at no, AI. I just, want to, I just want to add to that. I used to use the phrase with buyers, I'm going to kidnap you. It's only going to take half an hour of your life. Humor me. Yeah. And I would take them to a completely different neighborhood which checked all of the boxes for them at a price that they felt much more comfortable with. Yeah. And they often bought that property. Yeah. And 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 it's a discovery process and you got to be open-minded, right? Don't be closed, might be open-minded. And and look, agents, again, you're you're agents are psychiatrists, psychologists, and, and they have to John, why are you laughing? Well, I'm just thinking of like a, you know, like a, like a picture of an Upper West Side co-op on the back of a milk carton. Have you seen me? Have you <laughs> I, I, I get that. And you know, look, I look at AI and and look, agents out there, AI is a young, very exciting, just like the internet was. It it we haven't seen what this thing is capable of. We don't know what's gonna be mass adopted or what's not gonna be mass adopted. There's still a lot of hurdles, a lot of prompt engineering, there's a lot of definitions to do, there's a lot of output design, a lot of stuff to happen until this guy really gets to where it's gonna be. And you know, look, I'll just say that we all we already have an AI power tool and people don't think about us as an AI powered. We do. We have a property pricing wizard, a whole wizard that's powered by AI for time and a whole model there. So that's an AI powered tool that you could use to see, oh, well, how has the market changed over time? Which is one of the top questions. And you know, we have an AI labs. We're doing our own AI things, but I think this is going to play out. You know what agents should do, right? Educate themselves on how to interpret data better. All right. Forget about AI right now. All right. It's going to play out right? Don't, don't go crazy and stress yourself. How do I interpret this chart? What does this chart, what is this data telling me so that I can tell my buyer or seller in a digestible way what's happening? And that to us is most important. I think having those conversations is great. And I think we're at and the end here. Yeah. It, do you find that that's improving as time goes on? Do you find that agents are more data sensitive and are better at assimilating and digesting the data it's a, that you guys provide? It's a growing thing. A lot of agents are, are well-greased machines and they're doing their business with or without in their own way. And it may not include what we're doing or, or some other technologies. And, and you know what? They're like, hey, we're fine. But there is a growing number of, of users out there that are starting to understand, hey, I, I, I've seen this guy use it and he's mentioning it and it's working for him and he's telling me to look at that. And they're now starting to see that, all right, you know what? It doesn't matter where you're at. You could be at the top. You could always go higher. If you're at the top, it's easier to go higher than if you're at the bottom. If you're at the bottom, you know, that first you know, million of GCI, I don't know what you want to call it. That's the hardest. Once you get over that, you have resources, you can expand, you can get more people, you can get a team, you can grow that thing. But if you don't understand how to turn data into a simple conversation, the 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 barrier and the competition is going to just build a higher wall for you to compete with. And I think there's a growing, slowly, a growing number of agents that are starting to realize that connection and I have more agents saying, hey, look, I got to get a newsletter out. I got to get do something that's separate that satisfied the needs for what, what's going on in the market. So in that yeah, sense, and yes. It, I would actually let me, uh, I think that's beautifully said. And let me just say one thing about that. If you as an agent are thinking about creating a newsletter, figure out a way to make it interesting. 
because so many people are doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. And data isn't enough. Data is great, but it isn't enough. <laughs> you got to put a spin on your newsletter that makes it feel like it's yours. And I can't tell you how to do that because it's going to be different for everybody. You yeah. know, it depends on who you are, what's important to you. It's the same way I counsel people about social media. Nobody just wants to read about your deals and your listings. If yeah. all you're planning to do on social media is post your listings and your deals, nobody is going to pay any attention to you. Yeah, it's it's got to be interesting. Right. Yeah, and, and don't co-mingle. Right. Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to say this, this is really, you know, words of wisdom from a master because listeners out there, if you go through and you look at Fred's pieces at Forbes, if you go through the Warburg quarterly reports, every single one of those is written in his voice. And there's a specific kind of prose that Fred writes in, which is completely different than all the other reports, which are very stat focused. This is a much more personal nuance. And it's it, Fred, it's your voice that comes through and it makes it the one of the few that I read on a regular basis. So, you know, kudos yeah. to you for oh, that. And I think you're John. exactly right. Put it in your voice and people read it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Very, and very good advice. Out something interesting to say. Yeah. You know what you, you can know? do? And we'll end it here. Talk, talk to a couple of your buyers and ask them, what would you like to see from me on a monthly basis? Great That's it, idea. guys. Talk to buyers and talk to 10 people. See what they say. I, I would be interested in seeing this and you'll, your eyes will be awakened. We gotta yeah. end. We're out of time. Fred Peters, thank you so much, so, so much for coming here and sharing some thoughts. And if I'm going to go over time with anyone, it's going to be you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. President of CB Warrior. That is John Walkup over there. I am Noah Rosenblatt. This has been Talking Manhattan, and we'll catch you next time.